Praise the Lord, everybody. Uh, praise the Lord. We do thank you for joining us for another Central Jersey Bible Institute encouragement series session. If we do thank the Lord for blessing us with the opportunity that he has to allow us to come before him to dine and to feast on that which he has provided for all of us. I'm hoping, praise the Lord, like you all, that when we walk from here, we walk away feeling so much more full in the spirit than we are right now. Amen. But uh, before we uh, go into the service uh, and turn the hands over into our instructor for the evening, uh, praise the Lord. I will uh, invite everybody to, uh, to bow with their heads with me as we go before the Lord and petition that he will bless us with his presence in Jesus' name. Let every heart pray. Uh, Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we love and thank you. We ask, Lord God, that you will look upon us, Lord, that you will look upon your people favorably, that you would see a people, Lord, who are here for no other reason but to worship you, to honor you, to lift up your name. Lord God, and Lord, to reverence you. We're asking, Lord, that uh, you would feed us, Lord, the food that you have set aside just for us, and that when we receive this food, Lord God, we will receive it, uh, Lord God, as your word, uh, with full understanding uh, and knowledge and wisdom, that it will be all encapsulated with everything uh, that is fruitful uh, to your name in Jesus' name. We're asking that you bless every household represented here, that you look upon us favorably. Again, Lord, that you would keep us from all evil, that you rebuke the enemy from us, that we may be able to learn of you without distraction, and that you will bless your manservant with your wisdom and your ways, that, Lord, you will make him sensitive to the move of your Holy Ghost, that he, Lord God, would know how to govern, Lord, uh, your, uh, your words unto his people, Lord, as you see fit. Lord, we're asking that you keep us all rapture ready. Bless everyone here, everyone on their way, and those that couldn't make it, bless as well. Keep us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We do pray, amen and amen. Amen. And again, we say praise the Lord unto you all. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, praise the Lord. Give unto the Lord who is the head of my life. Uh, praise the Lord unto the pastor of the house, uh, GRCC, as well as the president of the Central Jersey Bible Institute in the person of Elder John Betts, and to his uh, lovely wife, uh, First Lady Loria Betts, uh, to uh, the house, Mother Ida Harrell. Uh, praise the Lord. And to my wife, Sister Chantel Bonet, and on behalf of the Central Jersey Bible Institute board, Praise the Lord unto you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this evening, praise the Lord, we have with us a man, a wonderful man of God, a good friend of mine. I've known for a long time, and I'm thankful that uh, the Lord saw fit to uh, open the door of utterance to allow him to come to uh, spend some time with us uh, and to help break the bread of life that we may walk out of here so much more stronger than we were before we got here. And uh, the instructor for the evening, praise the Lord, is Elder Mark Brantley. Uh, amen. So I invite all of you, amen, to uh, sit back as we turn the service over to his, into his hands uh, in Jesus' name. Elder Brantley, praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord, Elder Bonet. And uh, certainly thank you for uh, the opportunity. Uh, of course, giving honor to Jesus Christ, who's the head of my life, and uh, to uh, Pastor Betts in his absence, and of course, um, Elder Bonet and uh, all the people of God. We thank God for this opportunity uh, to share from the word of God. And um, I would take that everyone could see the uh, shared screen uh, that we will be instructing from. And uh, the name of our uh, lesson today uh, is the seven I am's. Amen. The seven I am's. And um of course, uh, the seven I am's are all recorded and only recorded uh, in John's gospel. Uh, the other writers um, do not um, contain the I am declarations. Uh, John's writing of uh, the I am's and actually just the writing from his perspective of Jesus Christ uh, is unique from the other gospel writers. Uh, if you notice um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, they, their gospels are known as the synoptic gospels. And um, they kind of, uh, when read together, give a comprehensive um, uh, and summary um, of the ministry of Jesus Christ and from the perspective of his humanity. Uh, for, Ma for Matthew's gospel, he's writing uh, to the Jewish people, and he starts off his ge genealogy uh, with uh, 
tracing the lineage of Jesus Christ to King David, because if you are uh, the, claiming to be the Messiah, uh, you have to be a son of David. So uh, he was writing to the Jewish nation and his gospels, Matthew, only uh, is the only gospel that speaks of the kingdom of heaven. The other gospels do not contain the kingdom of heaven uh, parables. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Mark was writing to the Romans. Uh, his perspective was uh, having or, or viewing Jesus as a servant leader, uh, as also a, con a conqueror, because the Romans, they were in power, and uh, they were known uh, in the book of Daniel as the legs of iron, and they crushed anyone um, that uh, was in their way. And then you have Luke's gospel, he being a physician, writing to the Greeks. Uh, even when we see in Acts of the Apostle, he speaks of Otheophilus, uh, who was a Greek. And um, his genealogy starts off uh, with the two miraculous births, uh, the one of John the Baptist and then the one uh, of Jesus Christ, both being miracle babies, but Jesus' birth being even more of a miracle than John. John's birth uh, was done before, or should I say the fact that Elizabeth was barren, that was nothing new, even though it was a miracle. The Old Testament records, even with uh, Sarai during the time, Abraham's wife, uh, she was barren and she yet had a child. But the birth of Jesus Christ is even set apart from that uh, and is the first ever recorded um, prior to or subsequently of a woman uh, uh, bringing forth a child without a natural father, but yet uh, Jesus was born by the Holy Spirit. So they focus, those synoptic gospels, they uh, pretty much focus on the humanity of Jesus Christ, whereas John's gospel uh, focuses on the deity of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, John had a uh, greater understanding of who Jesus was, even when uh, he saw the Lord Jesus Christ on the Isle of Patmos. So uh, when we think of the I am declarations, uh, and there are seven, uh, we it, it, it should trigger in your mind the first time you've heard uh, I am. Now, there are other instances prior to the time of Moses where the Lord declared, I am. Um, as a matter of fact, to Abraham, he the God declared, I am uh, the almighty God, the El Shaddai. Um, but we're referring to uh, this particular I am, which is first seen in uh, God's conversation with Moses uh, out of the burning bush. And that's in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. And then uh, in the conversation, God telling Moses that he wants to send him to Egypt to tell Pharaoh to let uh, his people go. Uh, Moses then asked God, who spoke out of the bush uh, and out of the flame of fire, uh, asked God, uh, who should I say um, is sending me? Uh, what is your name in essence? And God responded, uh, and the scripture reads, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shall thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent unto you. Now, the Hebrew word in this uh, particular passage of scripture uh, for I am is haya. Uh, and if you, you phonetically can pronounce Haya, H-A-W-Y-A-W, that's the Hebrew word. And Haya means uh, to be or to exist. And, uh, you know, while I was doing the uh, research of this, you know, I can recall uh, when uh, I hear uh, other people speak in tongues or um, I've even noticed that time, it will call um, that I've spoken in tongues. And the uh, tongues haya haya is actually stating uh, I am that I am. 
Uh, so if you ever heard yourself say that or someone else speaking in tongues say that, uh, they are speaking of God's name. I am that I am in Hebrew. Uh, it's a simple but very profound word because the name of God is existence itself. Uh, very simple but profound. Um, I am, I exist. And we know that God is the self-existing one. Uh, he has no beginning. He is the beginning. Um, everything came out of God. And he didn't come from anywhere, but everywhere came from him. Amen. So when we look at the Hebrew word haya, uh, that is where the word Yahweh is derived from. Uh, it's pronounced, uh, although it's haya, later it became uh, Yahweh because the Jews were very uh, concerned about pronouncing because the name was so holy. Uh, so they took out uh, the vowels and then it became Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, and that was pronounced as Yahweh. And then later the word was Latinized into our English, which uh, for I am uh, Jehovah. Uh, Jehovah is just a Latinized version of Yahweh uh, which still means I am. I am that I am, or I am who I am. And as we know, God was speaking when he was talking to Moses uh, from the bush, uh, he was speaking out of the flame of fire. You know, we focus, uh, when we see the, think of the scene of Moses uh, in front of the bush, and yes, uh, the scriptures do mention the bush, but we have a tendency to focus more on the bush than the flame of fire because the uh, bush being on fire and the bush not being consumed uh, kind of symbolized a combination of the terrestrial glory, which is the bush, and the celestial glory, which was the flame of fire that uh, didn't cause the bush to burn. And likewise, John, uh, when he records these um, I am declaration, he is in essence capturing uh, the combination of uh, Jesus' terrestrial glory, being that he was in the flesh, and his celestial glory, uh, which uh, indicates that he was also divine. He was God manifested in the flesh. And we see that in John 1.14. And as it read, the, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word being the celestial glory was made flesh, the terrestrial glory, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, in that verse, the word, just like the word that was mentioned in John one and one, where John wrote and said, uh, wrote rather, uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Uh, that word in the Greek is logos. Amen. Logos. Uh, and when we think of logos uh, in our English vernacular, uh, the word logo comes to mind. And that's why I put uh, these two logos, uh, well, one picture is a set of logos, and then there's one individual logo uh, of the Church of uh, Central Jersey uh, Bible Institute. That is the logo uh, for the Institute. And then these logos are uh, for Pepsi Cola. Of course, everyone knows the Colonel, Burger King. Harvard University, NASA, the uh, government um, uh, space program, uh, Apple, uh, if you have an iPhone or iPad, and of course, Google, when you search. And the reason why I have these logos um, is to give you kind of a picture as to what the logos is in the Greek, and that these logos um, are the expression of the corporate entity. Uh, you should be able to look at the logo 
and identify the entity that's behind it. So by seeing this globe that's red, white, and blue, I automatically have an association with the company, the corporate entity. And here, John is saying that Jesus, or the word, the logos, uh, was in the beginning with God and was God, because Paul picks it up and says that Jesus is the express uh, image of the invisible God. So when you saw Jesus, you saw a God expressed, uh, just wrapped in flesh. Amen. So when we think of the seven I am declarations, uh, the first is found in John chapter 6, verse 35. And Jesus declares that he's the bread of life. The second in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus declares that he's the light of the world. John chapter 10, verse 7, Jesus states that I am the door. John 10, 11, and 14, I am the good shepherd. John eleven twenty five, 25, uh, I'm the resurrection and the life. And then John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then John 15, 1, I am the true vine. So those are the seven uh, I am declarations. So the first that we're going to look at is uh, the first utterance or the first declaration, which is, um, I am the bread of life. And the scripture reads in John 6, 35, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me, cometh to me, shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Now, this being the first of the I am declarations, Jesus had just fed uh, the multitude with a few fish and uh, a few loaves of bread. And the multitude was fed. It was over 5,000. They also picked up um, the fragments that were left over and they put them and placed them in baskets. And then... Um, Later, when Jesus went to the other side, of course, the people followed. And uh, Jesus noted to them, you know, that uh, the only reason why you're coming to hear me uh, is because of the fish and the bread that you ate. In other words, um, I guess whatever uh, God presents and serves is good. Amen. Just like in the beginning. Uh, when he created the heavens and earth, and he said, let there be light. Uh, and then he divided the firmament. Uh, he said, it is good. And um, if I was to use my imagination, I'm sure this was probably the best bread and fish uh, uh, that they ever had in their life. Amen. Long John Silvers wouldn't have anything. Uh, or your... Uh, Neighborhood fish fry wouldn't have anything on uh, the fish sandwiches uh, that Jesus uh, provided in terms of this meal. And uh, so they figured that they were going where the, uh, where the food was. And Jesus brought that to the attention. You know, you're more focused on the, on the blessing than you are on the blesser, right? And we have a tendency to do that as well. We focus more on the miracles than on the miracle worker who was is, who is Jesus Christ. And he told them that you were just uh, concerned about the fish and the bread and not the miracle. And that's what prompted Jesus to declare uh, that he is uh, the bread of life. He also told them, you know, don't labor for the things uh, that are temporal. Right, because after you eat the fish sandwich, it's it's all it's all said and done. But focus on and labor on those things that lead to everlasting life, and that's what he was trying to do: is get them to focus on the right thing. And then uh, the people asked uh, Jesus for a sign, uh, referencing Moses. You know, uh, well. 
Moses in the wilderness, uh, he uh, had manna uh, come down from heaven. So why don't you uh, show us a sign as well? And uh, Jesus responded uh, that, number one, Moses uh, didn't give you that bread from heaven. All right? Don't get it twisted. Uh, God granted Moses uh, his request uh, to send food, but it wasn't Moses that brought the bread down from heaven, but it was God that did it. And not only that, uh, but God in this instance is giving you true bread from heaven. Amen. And Jesus was alluding to himself as being uh, the bread from heaven. Uh, and then Jesus mentioned that the bread of God is uh, Jesus, because he said, for the bread of God, in verse 33, is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So here Jesus was speaking of himself. He was the only one that came down from heaven to give life to the world. Then uh, they asked for this bread, um, again, thinking carnally, right? Um, not discerning what Jesus was declaring to them. So that's what prompted Jesus to declare, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Now, in Jesus' description of this bread, of life. Jesus said, if you eat it, you'll never hunger and you will never thirst, which symbolizes that you will have continual satisfaction. So it's not a hunger and a thirst naturally, but it's a hunger and thirst of the soul. And if you eat this bread of life, which is Jesus, you will never hunger, never thirst. And you know what? Jesus is telling them, you will never die as well, but you will live forever. Why? Because this bread, he said, is living bread. Amen. Uh, living bread, which will sustain you. Uh, this, and then uh, Jesus qualified the living bread as being his flesh that he gives for the life of the world. And then he continued uh, after then associating the living bread as being his flesh, he said, unless you eat of his flesh and drink his blood, he, you will have no life in you. Now, uh, this is where the, the, the rubber meets the road. Amen. Um, and now uh, Jesus is kind of amping things up. Uh, because now he's saying, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you will have no life in you. Now, when we think of uh, Jesus' flesh and his blood, uh, Paul gives us uh, a greater understanding that Jesus is referring to the Lord's Supper, right? Because uh, when we have communion, uh, we are celebrating or memorializing, is a better word, um, the death of Jesus Christ, uh, giving his body, his flesh for us, and shedding his blood for the remission of our sins. So uh, in essence, Jesus was telling them, unless you partake of my supper, you're not going to have life in you. Amen. And also what comes to mind is when Abraham met uh, Melchizedek uh, after the battle of the five Mesopotamia, it was kind of like a, uh, at that time, a world war. I think it was in Genesis chapter 14, where you had the five Mesopotamian kings uh, doing battle with the kings of Canaan. And uh, they captured, uh, the Mesopotamian kings captured Lot took him captive, and then uh, Abraham uh, got together his uh, servants, about 300 men, along with the, um, the Canaanites that he was in confederate with, uh, Eshkol and I believe Mamre uh, were their names. And uh, they went and rescued Lot. And 
in the king's dale after the battle, amen, and God gave Abraham the victory, uh, 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 he met this mysterious figure, amen, that seemed to have stepped out of eternity into time uh, because he was known as the king of Salem. Uh, but yet uh, Salem was not, or Jerusalem, uh, Salem being short, was not yet established at that time. Uh, it was called Jebus or Jebus was the word for Jerusalem or was the name of the city prior to Jerusalem being established. Um, so yet this person uh, was known as the King of Salem and his name was also translated the King of Righteousness. And it's my supposition, and this is only my opinion, uh, that it was uh, Jesus Christ making an appearance um, uh, as he would be uh, in the millennium, uh, because eventually Jesus will sit on the throne um, of David in Jerusalem when he established his millennial reign. And I believe it was at this time that uh, Jesus uh, came and presented himself uh, to give Abraham. That's why Paul says in the book of Hebrews that Abraham saw my day and rejoiced because he met Jesus of the future uh, uh, as King, uh, as Melchizedek. Uh, but that's another message. Um, so here Jesus is saying uh, that his flesh is the living bread. And he said, your fathers ate manna and died, right? Um, as a matter of fact, there were those that had manna and didn't even make it into the promised land. And even those that didn't make it into the promised land, they died later. But Jesus is saying, if you eat his flesh, his, the living bread, you shall never die. Amen. Those that eat of this bread, he said, shall live. And then I'm also reminded of the shoe bread, right? In the Old Testament, in the, in the house of God, the tabernacle, and then later on in the temple. Moses was commanded to have 12 loaves of bread uh, called the show bread that were, was on the table in the holy place. Uh, the holy place being two compartments, uh, the holy place proper, and then the holy of holies, uh, which where the Ark of the Covenant was in the mercy seat. But in the holy place proper, you had the candlestick, you had the table of shoe bread, and you had the golden, uh, the altar, golden altar of incense. And this shoe bread symbolized uh, then that God will always have uh, sustenance. He will always provide uh, because the priests were allowed to eat the show bread. Um, when they brought in fresh loaves, I think it was on a weekly, every Sabbath, they had to bring fresh loaves of shoe bread. And the shoe bread that was taken out, the priests were allowed to eat. So God always has bread in his house. I believe Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, is known as what? The house of bread. Amen. Now, when Jesus declared that he was the bread of life and that unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, uh, the, there were those that thought uh, Jesus' uh, words were a hard saying. That's what they said. They said, Jesus, what you're saying is hard uh, to follow because they, all, they automatically thought Jesus was referring uh, to cannibalism when he said to eat my flesh uh, and to drink my blood. And um, so they began to murmur, right? Now the disciples were 70 strong and within those 70, you had the 12. So when Jesus mentioned to eat his flesh and drink his blood, uh, you had the majority of them, I guess 58 that left. And only the 12 that he originally called remained. And that's when Jesus asked the 12, uh, are you going to leave as well? And then Peter responded, well, Lord, who are we going to go? To whom shall we go? 
you alone have the words of eternal life. So next uh, declaration we have, after I am the bread of life, Jesus declares, I am the light of the world. Amen. And in verse, uh, in chapter eight, uh, verse 12, Jesus says, uh, then spake Jesus again unto them saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now, what's interesting here is that now Jesus uh, is making an appearance uh, in the temple because at this time, it's during the Feast of Tabernacles. But before we go there, um, John makes reference to the light, right, in chapter one, because not only does he uh, declare that um, uh, Jesus uh, the word was in the beginning and uh, and the word was with God and the word was God, but he also mentioned about Jesus being the light. And uh, I need to get the right uh, quote because down here I put John uh, 6, 12, but it's actually John uh, 1, uh, chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. And um, a portion of that, it says, uh, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same, meaning John, came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, meaning John, but was sent to bear witness of that light who was Jesus Christ. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So this is why we know John's gospel has a different perspective because even in the beginning, um, he speaks to the fact uh, that Jesus is the light of the world. Now, as I mentioned, Jesus is now in the temple and he's there on the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot uh, is a feast, one of seven feasts of the Lord uh, I believe in Leviticus 24, it lays out all the seven feasts. And I love this to, to teach on the feasts of the Lord because it's very important. It has to do with God's roadmap. And Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles, all uh, men all were, or all of Israel was required to come uh, to Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, in the millennium, uh, it will be a requirement. Um, for everyone to come to Jerusalem uh, to worship. And the Bible says, if you fail to come, that God would not send you rain. Now, remember, in the millennium, everything will now be agricultural. It will not be as industrial or technological as today, all right? Um, it speaks about beating the um, spears into pruning hooks, uh, and the uh, and weapons into plowshares, which t lets us know that we will be going back to an agrarian agricultural society. So if you have a farm and you don't come up to the Feast of Tabernacles, guess what? You won't get any rain. That means you won't eat because you won't be able to grow any crops. And we know that the Feast of Tabernacles is the last of the feast days, right? Uh, the first of, of the feast, Passover, uh, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost, four of the spring feasts, and then the three fall feasts, Feast of Trumpets, Feast or the Day of Atonement, and then also, and then last is the Feast of Tabernacle. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, in the future, uh, this Tabernacle will be, for, Feast of Tabernacles will be fulfilled because it really deals with how God dwells uh, amongst his people, right? Because when they were in the wilderness, they were told to make huts. Uh, and when you celebrate Sukkot, you had to make these like small huts. Be you had to have the ability to put it up and break it down because they were constantly on the move in the wilderness. 
and the way they were specifically encamped in the wilderness. Uh, and I can't, I'm not going to, but if you read the book of Ezekiel, you'll kind of get an idea as to where, uh, the, how they were encamped uh, based on those cherubims that have the four faces. Uh, they were encamped with three uh, uh, tribes to the east, led by Judah. Uh, there were three tribes to the south, three to the west, and three to the north. And in the midst were the Levites, where the tabernacle was, and that's where God dwelled in the midst of Israel. So while they were in these huts, uh, God was tabernacling with his people. And in the future, uh, Jesus will be tabernacling as the king um, of king and lord of lords during his millennial reign. Now, what's interesting is that historians and scholars say that um, on the Feast of Tabernacles, there is a lighting ceremony, a lighting ceremony in the court of the women, because there, you know, there was a separation between the men and the women. But at the in the court of the woman, there were these oil lamps, and there was a ceremony to light them uh, in the temple, in the court of the woman. So here in the court of the women, uh, uh, all of a sudden, um, the leadership brings uh, a woman who was caught in adultery to Jesus on the Feast of Tabernacles when you have the celebration of the lighting of the lamps in the court of the woman. So now here they bring a woman and they are bringing it to her to Jesus say she was caught in adultery. But where was the man, right? Because according to Moses, the law of Moses, you had to bring both the men, the, the man and the woman for both of them to be stoned. But Jesus knew it was a setup and they just brought the woman and they asked him, well, Jesus, what are you going to do about this? You know what the law of Moses uh, tells you to do. And then uh, Jesus responded as he wrote on the ground, right? He stooped and wrote on the ground. And um, we all, you know, there's a saying that there was only three times that uh, God wrote with his finger. Uh, the first time was during uh, when he gave the Ten Commandments uh, on the, stone, the tablets of stone. Uh, the second time was uh, in Daniel's day when uh, Belshazzar defiled the vessels of the temple and a hand uh, wrote on the wall, meaning, meaning, tikal the farsin. And then the third time is this instance where Jesus, who is God manifested in the flesh, stoops down and writes on the ground. And after he wrote on the ground, Jesus asked the question, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And it's interesting that Jesus uses this Feast of Tabernacles backdrop, uh, which has to do with the lighting of the women, of the court of the women. Um, and at the same time, um, some would say that he was probably, when he wrote again, uh, was writing down the names of the ones uh, and, and was accounting for their sins. But nevertheless, everyone left because no one could cast a stone because everyone has sin. And you know what? When you are confronted with the light of the world, you realize how sinful you are. When you confront the light of the world, you find how lacking you are. And Jesus being the light of the world showed the sin in them. That's why Jesus asked the question, if you're without sin, then you cast the first stone. And when they all left, Jesus asked the woman, where are your accusers? And she said, there are none, Lord. Amen. And Jesus said, well, I condemn you I don't condemn you either. So go and uh, sin no more. So here, those who follow Jesus as the light of the world will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Amen. And then when we see, uh, remember, I mentioned that 
the reference of tabernacle uh, uh, has to do with the future. Uh, it will be with Jesus tabernacling with us in Jerusalem, but even more so uh, in eternity future. Because the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 3, uh, and also 22 verse, verses 22 to 23 reads, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So here we see the full manifestation of the glory of God tabernacling with us in eternity in the holy city. And there will be no need for sun because God will provide the light. He's the light of the world, right? Amen. Uh, before uh, there was the sun and the moon, God had already spoken, let there be light. So there was a light God provided even before the sun, the moon, and the stars were in glory. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So Jesus is the light of the world. And now we get to our third declaration uh, that uh, Jesus is the door. He says, I am the door. Now, this picture is a picture of a sheep hole, and I want you to uh, pay attention to it. Um, if you notice where the shepherd is sitting, right behind him is a door. Amen to the sheep hole. This is how, this is a uh, kind of an animated uh, depiction of a sheep hole, but it's built with stones. Um, you know, some aren't as elaborate, um, but usually it was built with stone with a door and a large enough for sheep, uh, depending on your uh, economic status. Um, there were other shepherds that uh, not only cared for their flock, but for other flocks. So you needed a larger uh, sheep hole. John chapter 10, verse 7 through 10. Uh, then said Jesus, uh, let's see here. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter and he shall be saved and shall go in and out, and find pasture. Amen. Now the sheep hole was a metaphor and it was understood by most because of why? Israel was an agricultural society, right? Not like we have today. Uh, you know, was, was, it techni uh, was it technological? It wasn't industrial. Um, although there were things that uh, existed in times past that really can't be duplicated today like the pyramids and other things. But for the most part, it was an agrarian society, an agricultural society. So in essence, uh, Jesus gave the sheep hope metaphor to, to teach uh, a lesson in the language they understood. And he was focusing his, uh, this metaphor as he being the door really to the religious leaders because they considered themselves as having, as being the door to Judaism. But Jesus is telling the religious leaders that you must enter at the door of the sheephole if you're gonna be in God's flock. So Jesus declared that he is the door. So that's a bold statement, not just telling the people, but the Jewish leaders to say, if you wanna be in God's flock, and they could have, they, they can identify with that uh, because of David, right? Uh, in Psalm 23, uh, he says, Jesus is, I am the door. And, you, and if you're going to come into the sheepfold, uh, you 
must come through him. And if you try to come in any other way, it's as a thief and a robber of the sheep, right? So if you don't come through Jesus Christ, and you find that in the church today, you got folk that don't want to come through the door because they want to come in another way because they don't want to come through Jesus. And if you come any other way but through Jesus, then you come as a thief and a robber of the sheep. Now, Jesus being the door and declaring that he is the door dispels all these myths that there are different ways to God, right? You got some people that say there are many paths to Buddha or uh, that uh, uh, Christianity isn't the only way to God. Well, Jesus is telling you right here that he's the door. And if you don't come his way, you can't get to God. Jesus said, if you enter in through him, you will be saved. You will also go in and out and find pasture, right? That picture of the sheep hole. You'll be able to go in and you'll be able to go out and find pasture because the shepherd will lead you in and out and you will find green pastures. Again, he mentions in, in the same uh, teaching that the thief uh, comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. So if you're not coming through him, you're coming for another purpose. You're coming for another mission, and that's to steal, kill, and to destroy. And then Jesus said, but he that comes, uh, he comes to the sheep uh, that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Now, in that same uh, chapter of verse 7, uh, where Jesus speaks that he is the door, read verse 7. Let me just double check. For, I'm sorry, chapter 10, beginning at verse 7. Uh, Jesus, after he speaks about the door, he then later on in that verse declares that he is the good shepherd. And that starts in verse 11. So he's talking uh, about the door uh, from verses 1 through 10. That's the door of the sheephole. And you have the picture of the sheephole. And then we see the shepherd at the door. So Jesus is saying that not only is he the door of the sheephole, and that's the way for you to get in his flock, but he's also the shepherd of the sheephole. And he says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. So not only is Jesus the door, he's the good shepherd that's at the door. And the good shepherd stands at the door of the sheephole to do what? He watches what comes in and he watches what goes out. Amen. And the good shepherd also watches over the sheephole because of the ravenous wolves, right? And, and the predators that try to come in the other way, the thief and the robber that come to kill, steal, and destroy. Amen. So the shepherd also watches over the sheep. And not only does he watch over the sheep hold uh, and the sheep, but he also will lay down his life, right? He has to defend the sheep in case a wolf happened or even a stranger happens to come into the sheep hold to, to kill, steal, and destroy. Because you got other people other than the wolves and the other wild animals, you got people that want to steal the sheep. Uh, so here, the shepherd, the good shepherd, and, and, and uh, you know, Jesus makes these fine distinctions, right? Not only is he a shepherd, but he is the good shepherd, which implies they're bad shepherds. But he is the definite article, 
good shepherd. And the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. But the hireling, right? Because sometimes a shepherd has a, a, an assistant. Uh, the shepherd may need to go to town for, for something or may need to go into the house uh, or have to conduct other business or he just can't be there all the time, 24 hours. So he needs to hire uh, a hireling uh, to assist him. But the hireling um, is not like the good shepherd because push come to shove, if a wolf comes to get the sheep, you know what? The hireling takes off because he's not vested in the sheep. No one is invested in the flock than the good shepherd. Jesus will be with you through thick and thin. Some pastors come and go, but the good shepherd will stay with you. He said, I'll never leave you, neither forsake you, but I'll be with you until the end of the age. That's why he is the good shepherd. Amen. Uh, so here, Jesus was referring to the good shepherd because they also had an understanding of Psalm 23, right? What David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David himself was a shepherd. He protected his flock from the ravenous uh, lion and bear. That's one of the reasons why he was able to come against Goliath uh, with righteous indignation, because God gave a lion and a bear in his hands that tried to rob, steal, kill, and destroy. So David wrote this psalm uh, as a shepherd, saying that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Amen. Because the good shepherd provides for the sheep, uh, and they lack nothing. Right? Sheep doesn't have to worry about where their next meal is coming from. Thank you, Jesus, because the good shepherd is going to take care. Uh, he leads them uh, into green pastures, right? Into a place where they can graze in comfort, not in brown, dry pastures, but in green pastures. And he also leads them beside the still waters not waters that are roaring because a sheep don't want to go into anything that's troubling. But the sh shepherd will lead you in, in a place of the, of the brook or the creek where it's still. Amen. As opposed to other places where it's rough. Amen. And then the good shepherd is going to lead you in the paths of righteousness, right? As David said, he leads me in the path of righteousness. He's going to put you in a safe and lead you in a safe path, which is in righteousness. Amen. Uh, right? Uh, uh, narrow is the way to right to righteousness. Uh, broad is the way to what? Destruction. And if you are on the path of righteousness, you're on the path of eternal life, not to destruction. And then it says, uh, uh, he'll... Your, uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Why? Because your rod and your staff comfort me. So despite death being around me, uh, the shadow of death, uh, God comforts me with his rod and his staff, which are the tools of the shepherd. So they had an idea what Jesus was saying when he said that he was the good shepherd. Not only that, the good shepherd anoints the sheep, right? That's why David said, thou anointed my head with oil. Amen. He gives us victory over your enemies, uh, victory over the ravenous wolves and the lions and the bears. Uh, that's why he says, thou uh, prepare the table in the presence of mine enemies. He keeps the sheep in the sheep hole forever by his grace and mercy. That's why David said in Psalm 23, and I shall dwell in the house. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And Jesus is saying that he's going to keep his sheep in the sheephold, and they will be saved. Amen. 
Then Jesus also said that there are other sheep that are not of this fold. He's talking uh, to the Jewish leadership now, where he says uh, that there are other sheep that he has that's not of his fold. Now, I mentioned earlier in the sheepfold, the shepherd may have his flock, but he also may be caring for another flock. Um, and he's saying, uh, or it may be another sheepfold where that same shepherd is keeping someone else's sheep. Uh, but what Jesus is referring to here, that he has other sheep that are not of this fold, he was referring to the Gentiles. Because originally, Jesus came to the house of Israel. He came to the lost house of Israel with the gospel. But it was always the intention of the Lord uh, to save Gentiles. And that's what he was referring to when he has sheep uh, that are not of this fold. So now we get to uh, Jesus declaring that he is the resurrection and the life. And in John chapter 11, verse 25 through 26, Jesus declares, well, let me just read the, the verse. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And that's a very popular uh, scripture for the church. It should be for every child of God uh, because we look forward to the resurrection. That is our hope. Paul devotes chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians speaking of the resurrection and that if we were to have hope in this life only, he declares that we are men and women most miserable. But because we have the hope of glory that one day, this mortal will put on immortality and this corruption will put on incorruption. We have hope and we have joy, unspeakable and full of glory. So here um, in uh, chapter uh, 11, uh, Jesus gets word um, that uh, his friend Lazarus was sick. And um, Lazarus had two sisters, Martha and Mary. And Martha and Mary sent messengers to Jesus. Uh, you know, look, your friend Lazarus uh, is, is ill. And if you don't come, um, he just might die. And Jesus uh, told the messengers he will come. But Jesus waited. I believe Jesus waited a couple of days. Um, before he actually came um, or was uh, began to make his journey uh, to Bethany. And um, despite the human relationship that uh, he had, and this is the, one of the distinctions here of John's perspective, right? We've said that the synoptic gospels with Matthew, Mark, and Luke focused on the humanity aspects of Jesus. John is speaking, is writing from the perspective of his deity. So here we see that separation between the humanity of Jesus uh, and his deity, because on a humanity, on a humane level, uh, he should have come right away, right? Uh, because uh, he was connected uh, to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He loved them later on in the chapter, it says. Uh, it was Mary and Martha that and Lazarus that entertained Jesus uh, and the disciples into their home. Uh, so, uh, but nevertheless, Jesus knew that this was to glorify God and that there was a divine purpose and the humanity had to take a back seat and his divine, his deity was now uh, in the forefront. 
And Jesus actually knew and chose this instance to show the glory of God because he knew of the popularity because they were wealthy. They, they, they were, uh, uh, you know, if not uh, upper class, they were definitely upper middle class. Uh, and they lived in a suburb outside of Jerusalem. Amen. That's like living in Scarsdale, if you will, New York, uh, or living in Montclair, New Jersey, with, with New Jersey folk. Uh, amen. So, um, uh, so it was, they were well to do. And uh, Jesus knew that once he were to pass away, that uh, that once Lazarus would pass away, that uh, there would be many people there uh, to visit. I don't. I don't. Please put that. your uh, mics. Please put your mic on mute, please. Thank you. So here, uh, there were many Jews that came um, uh, to see Mary and Martha and to mourn with them, right? Um, and Jesus knew that because he wanted witnesses there uh, for this miracle. They were a popular family. Now, um, here, uh, when Jesus uh, um, appeared, uh, he had an exchange with Martha. And Martha was sorrowful because she said, Jesus, if you would have only been there. Now, what's interesting is that Martha came out to meet Jesus. Mary stayed home. But remember in the house when they first were entertaining Jesus and the disciples, Martha was busy waiting tables. Jesus, or uh, rather Mary was at the feet of Jesus and Martha got upset and said, well, why don't Mary help? Jesus said, leave her alone. She has chose the good part. But now we see that there's a switch here and that Martha now comes to meet Jesus and Mary stays home. And Martha is having this exchange with Jesus. So it's almost as though Martha is catching up, amen, to where Mary was, uh, speaking to Jesus, hearing Jesus' word. And they actually have a conversation. And it was on eschatology because Jesus was telling Mary, Mary, I mean, Martha, uh, Lazarus will live. Uh, and then Mary, not Mary, Martha had responded to Jesus. Uh, yes, Lord, I, I know he's going to live in the resurrection of the, uh, uh, at, at the end. So eschatol eschatologically, uh, this ex in this exchange, Martha was right. She probably was referring to Daniel chapter 12, where it speaks about a resurrection happening. But Jesus uh, uh, reveals to Martha, amen, uh, and not to Mary, because Mary's home. This is Martha now, one-on-one -on -one with Jesus, uh, that he was the resurrection and the life. In other words, Martha, you don't have to wait, amen, until the great white throne judgment. Uh, you don't have to wait uh, after the millennium but I'm the resurrection right now. I'm the life right now. I can make this thing happen right now. Amen. And we know that uh, uh, Lazarus was dead, and Jesus knew that, right? Because when, they, when, when, when uh, Jesus waited and the disciples, they didn't want Jesus to go because they knew the Jews were waiting for him in Jerusalem to take him captive. So they were worried that they were going in Bethany, which is right outside of, uh, of Jerusalem, not too far. And uh, Tom, Thomas uh, kind of, you know, his doubting self, he was uh, depressed and was like, all right, let's go and let's die with Jesus. So let's pack our bags and let's, let's go on to Lazarus' house. Um, and the Bible lets us know in verse 17 in that chapter uh, that Lazarus was in the grave for four days. Now, four days is important for us to know because 
the fact that it was four days, uh, corruption had set in because Martha alluded to the fact that his body was stink, um, stunk, right? Which is a sign of decay or rigor mortis. If you read in verse 39 of, of chapter 11, and it says, uh, when Jesus said, take away ye the, take ye away the stone, Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he had been dead four days. So despite, and you know they probably, being wealthy, wrapped them in all kinds of spices and myrrh and frankincense, and nevertheless, um, for, after four days, the body started to decay. Now, what's interesting uh, is that that gives us a timeline when it comes to corruption. Because in Psalm 16, David wrote uh, in, in prophesying of Jesus, for thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Psalm 1610. So David is prophesying that Jesus would be the his holy one. Jesus will not see corruption. So if corruption was seen by Lazarus four days, all right, Jesus could not be in the grave, we know, for at least four days. Do you see that? Because we know that Lazarus was being corrupted for four days, being in the grave four days. David is saying Jesus will not see corruption, so we know he will not be in the grave for four days. So then when Jesus gave the Jews a sign in Matthew 12, verse 40, when they asked Jesus for a sign, the, the religious leaders, Jesus said, you won't have a sign except for the sign of the prophet Jonah or Jonas. For as Jonas was, in, was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And that's in Matthew 12, 40. So we see that Jesus was not in the grave four days, but three. Three days and three nights before corruption set in. Amen. So this separates Lazarus being in the grave for four days, right? his body seeing corruption, which makes this uh, to the glory of God. You know, any resurrection is to the glory of God, but there's no, there was, there is a past history of resurrection. Uh, I believe it was in Elisha's day uh, where um, there were, they were carrying, men were carrying a dead man to bury him, and when they saw uh, the enemy uh, come, they threw the man on Elisha's grave, on the bones of Elisha, and that man came became alive again. Uh, and then I believe it was the Shunammite woman's son, um, where Elijah uh, had raised him uh, from the dead after he may have suffered a head. Uh, uh, hemorrhage. Uh, when he that time he came to his mother and he said, "My head, my head," and then he died. But Elijah came and resurrected her son. And then you have the damsel, uh, where Jesus kicked everybody out of the house except for uh, Peter, John, and James. And Jesus raised the called her Tabitha. Uh, the damsel tell her to ar to rise. And she rose from the dead. You see, but they weren't, they didn't see corruption. This instance, Lazarus had been dead four days and saw corruption. And that's what separated this resurrection from all other recorded resurrections. And this miracle was a visual representation because there were eyewitnesses that Jesus was able to not just raise a dead man, but to erase a dead man whose body was decayed. Amen. But despite 
the show of and, and display of the divine nature of Jesus Christ, say that. there was still his humanity that was still at play because he was grieving. The Bible says in verse 33 and 35 that he groaned in the spirit when he saw Martha and Mary uh, mourning and when the people were mourning. You know, you can be as strong as as uh, uh, as uh, a marble countertop. And, uh, you know, when you get around folk that you know and family that's weeping, uh, that weighs on you and softens the heart. And Jesus groaned in his spirit and the Bible says Jesus wept, but his humanity did not deter or stop him from exercising his divine power, uh, which was to raise Lazarus from the dead, telling him to come forth, and Lazarus came forth. Amen. So the next declaration that we're going to look at, as um, time uh, is slipping by, is that Jesus declared he's the way, the truth, and the life. And in verse John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus, uh, the scripture says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, in this situation, Jesus is now uh, comforting his disciples. Why? Because he's about to depart. Um, and he didn't want his disciples to be without hope. Uh, and that's why he started off, uh, as John records in chapter 14, uh, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go uh, to prepare a place for you, uh, and I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may also, may be also. So here he's telling them, I'm going away, uh, but I want you to be confident. Uh, and in essence, Jesus is speaking to them in the context of a Jewish wedding. Because it was typical for the bridegroom, uh, after he's betrothed, to go away. Um, to prepare a place for his wife, his bride, and himself. And it's typically uh, a section of property belonging to the father. So the idea of uh, the bridegroom going away to his father's house to prepare a place was in the context of a Jewish wedding. And this is um, how he was trying to comfort uh, the disciples that he's going to his father's house and you know what my father got plenty of room in my father's house are many mansions and we got property uh, galore and I'm going away to prepare this place why because uh, when it comes to a wedding when the bridegroom comes back he comes back when the father tells him it's time to get his bride and while the bride is waiting, uh, she needs to be prepared because she doesn't know when the father is going to tell the bridegroom to go get your bride. That's why uh, uh, Jesus, when he spoke of uh, the, his coming, the rapture, in Matthew 24, verse 36, the Bible says, but of that day and hour, no, if no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. Again, another reference to a Jewish wedding. The father tells the son, go get your bride. And what? The bride has to be ready. So that's in chapter 24. And then in chapter 25 of Matthew, Jesus gives the parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins, right? Uh, and the bridegroom went away. And they had to be ready and be prepared 
for when the bridegroom comes to call, they need to have their oil, uh, their lamps with oil and their wicks trimmed. And there were five wise, five foolish. And that's why, again, in chapter 25, it says, no, man, no one knows the day nor the hour, referencing a Jewish wedding. So when Jesus said he goes away, uh, Thomas then, here's Thomas again. Uh, remember, in, in, with Lazarus, Thomas uh, said, well, uh, we're going to go die, so let's go with Jesus and get killed. So now Jesus is saying he's going away. Uh, and he asked Jesus, well, Lord, where are you going? And, and how can we know where you're going? How can we know the way? And then Jesus responds and declares that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, he being the way means he is the path to travel. Right? A way is a road. A way is, is a path. Uh, a, a way is, as we call, a way of life, a path of life. And if you want to, if you want to see Jesus uh, again, you got to go his way, which is the way and path of righteousness. And then he also says the tr he's the truth, meaning his words are truth. And it's the truth that guides us. It's the truth that his word that sanctifies us and cleanses us. Uh, because we can be polluted by many things in this world. And things are said um, so much and so repetitively that you will start believing a lie. That's why it's important to cleanse yourself uh, and sanctify yourself through God's word. Because the pollutions of this world will have you um, believing what's right is wrong and what's wrong is right. And then Jesus is the life. Uh, if you want to see Jesus, you got to live the life of holiness. Right? He said, be holy for I am holy, the Lord said. And Jesus' life, which was a holy life, is to be emulated. We are to live like Jesus. That's what being a Christian is all about, right? Being Christ-like. Amen. So Jesus is the only way to heaven, just like he's the only way into the sheephole, right? He's at the door. And if you want to come in the sheephole, you got to come through the door. If you want to come in uh, to, to where Jesus is, he's the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the only way to get you to glory. Acts chapter 4, verse 10, verse, I'm sorry, verse 13. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. If it's not the name of Jesus, you cannot receive salvation. Acts 2.38 is right. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And the last declaration that we have, Jesus said that I am the true vine. And that's a good depiction of how a vine looks. Doesn't look all that fancy, right? Uh, but those grapes look nice. Amen. And refreshing. Clusters. Now, in John chapter 15, verse 1, Jesus starts off telling his disciples, because remember, Jesus is departing. So he's, he's encouraging and comforting his disciples. And he's telling them, uh, not only let not your heart be troubled, um, not only am I the way, the truth, and the life, but I also want you to know that I am the true vine. And my father is the husband. Now, what's implied there, Jesus makes a distinction between himself as the true vine and others who are not. There are others that represent themselves as being a vine. But Jesus is letting them know, I am the true vine. 
I know you have the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, and they are the religious leaders, but I'm the true vine. There are many vines out there. In essence, Jesus is declaring that he is the only source of life. And God the Father is the husbandman because Jesus also was known as the son of God. And because of his humanity, he subjected himself as the son of God, even though he was God manifested in the flesh. So he always gave glory to the father. And in this instance, he is saying that he's divine, right? All life comes from him and God is in control, amen, of how things grow. I believe Paul said um, some water, some plant, but it's God that gives what? The increase. So God the father is the husbandman and the husbandman is the person that is in charge of keeping the vine, like a landscaper. He makes sure it's watered. He makes sure that the vine is pruned uh, and cared for. Because if there is no husbandman, then the vine cannot produce the amount of grapes uh, on uh, based on its potential. And he's given that metaphor. Again, it's an agricultural metaphor about uh, relative to a grapevine. And uh, the disciples and future believers are the branches of the vine. So Jesus is saying he's the true vine. And in essence, the, uh, the, the disciples, the apostles are the branches and they're supposed to bring forth fruit. And the husbandman is there and he either removes the unproductive branches, fruitless branches, or he prunes the branches that are productive. Why? Because it's necessary to remove uh, the fruitless branches because they're taking up uh, the nutrients uh, that would otherwise go to the productive branches. Then you also have the uh, unproductive branches that are maybe blocking the uh, sunlight from the other branches. Uh, and it causes the, the growth of the fruit bearing branches uh, to be stunted. So the husbandman, uh, what he does is he removes the, the unproductive branches and the branches that are producing fruit, he prunes it. He removes the chaff, he removes anything, cuts things back uh, in order for it to produce more fruit. And that's what God wants us to be uh, as believers. He wants us to produce fruit. Now there's a dichotomy here because the fruit that we ought to produce are, are the saving of souls. Right? We need to replicate um, ourselves, not ourselves in, in terms of our personalities uh, and characteristics, but we need to replicate um, uh, to the building of the kingdom of God. Uh, we need to witness so that others could hear the gospel and then be saved. That's bringing forth fruit. But then the, there's a second part of that, which is. Uh, uh, bearing spiritual fruit, fruit of the spirit, right? Uh, love, uh, peace, joy, good uh, gentleness, meekness, temperance. We ought to bear those fruit as well uh, because it's those things that draw uh, believe, uh, unbelievers to Christ. So uh, also Jesus being the true vine and we being the branches, Jesus is in essence saying the branches cannot exist without the vine. Because in order for the branches to get the nutrients, the vine has to supply it. Because all the nutrients are in the soil. And even the water uh, is in the soil. Yes, there's the rain above, but in drought, 
that vine, those roots have to tap down into the water table in the earth and draw. And even when it rains, it rains in the earth, the roots draw the water into the branches. Because when the branches are wet with the rain, usually it evaporates. But when the earth is soaked, the vine can draw from the soaked earth and with the nutrients, the branches are nourished and can bear fruit. But you will never see a branch outside of the vine. I haven't seen one yet. If, if it's a branch and if it's bearing fruit, it's going to be connected to the vine. And Jesus is telling them, stay in the vine. There's going to be false people coming in my name. Stay in the vine because I am the true vine. Jesus says, abide in me uh, as I abide in you. Abide means to live or dwell, which is a way of life. And as a recap, as I close, uh, again, the seven. I am declarations. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 6, verse 35, I am the light of the world. John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the door. John chapter 10, verse 7, I am the good shepherd. John 10, verses 11 and 14, I am the resurrection and the life. John chapter 11, verse 25. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John chapter 14, verse 6. And the seventh, uh, I am the true vine. Amen. Those are the seven declarations. As you know, the number seven uh, is God's number of completion and fullness. And here, John declares, makes a record of these declarations to show the divinity and the deity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And at this time, we're going to open the floor uh, to uh, any questions that you may have. Praise the Lord. Can you hear me? Yes, praise the Lord. I really like the way you broke that down and the way you presented it. You made it plain and clear by using, uh, what am I trying to say? By using agriculture, I guess. And amen. I mean, it, it just really broke it on down. Well, amen. Amen. Yeah, and it's you know just just easy to explain the way you explained it, and it's easy to you know pick it up. Well, and, I appreciate that. Yeah, to understand. I mean, you broke it down to where anybody could understand it, even somebody that you know probably had never read the Bible or whatever, and it's it, it was easy to understand. And very, very edifying. It was, it was beautiful. I love it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And to God be the glory. Amen. And I'm, I'm glad uh, that you were blessed by it. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. Praise the Lord. Someone asked. Oh, I'm sorry. Go right ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Praise the Lord, Elder Brantley. This is Sister Praise Mitchell. The Lord. Hallelujah, yeah. from Greater Refuge Temple in Harlem. I have to be back with Mother Roe that everything was just so explicit. And I'm going through my seven pages of written notes. <laughs> and yeah, I just think that. It's so clear. <laughs> However, I do have a question in regards to the eschatology. Can yeah. you? expand on that because I'm still having problems comprehending the definition when it comes to the Bible. Amen. 
Well, uh, thank you for your uh, remarks, and I, I very much appreciate it. As uh, mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned to Mother Rose, always great to hear that uh, this these teachings are um, are edifying, and um, I give all glory to God. Um, as he shares it with me, I, I share it with his people. Um, regarding um, eschatology, that it just simply means the study of last things. Usually when we talk about the study of last things, we speak of the last days uh, regarding um, uh, things recorded in the Old Testament prophets and more specifically in the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, uh, even in the book of Ezekiel and Zechariah. But uh, what I refer to as Martha being eschatologically correct um, in her exchange with Jesus, uh, and I want to go to um, to the verse here um, in John eleven twenty three. Uh, it says, Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. And Martha's response was in verse 24, Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So when we speak of eschatology, we speak about things future. And Martha had an understanding that there would be a resurrection. Now, everyone in Israel didn't have that understanding. And even if they did, they weren't on the, all on the same page. Because remember, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, but the Sadducees did not. And in one account in Acts, Paul even utilized that distinction to kind of get out of a jam um, when he pit them against each other, because uh, they love to argue. So uh, he brought up the fact that one believed in the resurrection and the other Sadducees did not. So it was evidently Martha did believe uh, in the resurrection. Now there's not much scripture in the Old Testament because remember at, that, at this time, uh, there was no New Testament. There was only the Old Testament. And to my understanding, the uh, and I, I and there may be other references, but um, the one that um, I'm aware of um, is in Daniel chapter 12. Um, and it speaks of the future. Uh, and I'm going to read verses one and two. Uh, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, okay? Talking about the tribulation period, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. So now we're talking about um, past the tribulation and even past the battle of Gog and Magog at Satan's last rebellion. Um, and then verse two says, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So that's at the great white throne judgment that Daniel is writing on prophetically. So Martha may have had that understanding um, uh, or she may have been taught uh, of the resurrection. Uh, but the point um, of mentioning mentioning that she was uh, eschatologically correct is that she was. She said, Lord, that uh, Lazarus is going to rise again at the great white throne judgment, as Daniel spoke of in chapter 12. But Jesus is trying to let her know that we don't have to wait until the great white throne judgment. You see, Jesus is going to sit on that throne judging, but he's saying, I'm the resurrection right now. And even as John says in Reve uh, wrote in Revelation, 
uh, when the angel declared, "Blessed is he that is in the that takes part in the first resurrection, where the second death uh, has no part." Uh, so Jesus is uh, gonna is here as the resurrection, and even himself uh, is the first fruits of them that slept. So he will be the first to have died, be resurrected unto eternal life, immortality, incorruption. Uh, and he was trying to convey that to Martha that Lazarus doesn't have to be, doesn't have to wait then because the resurrection is talking to you right now. The life is talking to you right now. Jesus is in control. I hope that answers the question. Overwhelmingly wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Any other question? Or comment? Already, someone did um, ask in the chat, uh, uh, can a copy of the slides uh, uh, be made available? Um, and what I will do is make a set and send it to Elder Bonet, uh, and then um, Elder Bonet can disseminate it uh, accordingly. So, so the answer is, is yes. Any other question or comment? If not, uh, I'm going to turn it back into the hands of uh, Elder Bonet. And I see uh, Pastor Betts uh, that's on the um, Zoom. And um, just to say that um, I look forward to hearing him preach uh, at the convocation uh, in, uh, in July in Orlando. Elder Bonet, turn it back into your hands. Amen. Uh, video. Oh, amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. We, we, we also look forward to Elder Betts uh, uh, going up there and uh, serving God in the way that he does. Uh, name. We were talking about that not too long ago. Amen. Um, but truly, we do thank the Lord for blessing us this evening, for giving us, amen, a wonderful lesson as he has, amen, through his manservant, uh, Elder Mark Brantley. Amen. On the seven I am's. And, and I do have to concur. Uh, amen. That uh, the lesson was very, very uh, straightforward, um, uh, presented uh, eloquently and, uh, and, and very enlightening. Um, it's important for us to try to see Jesus in all of his vantage points and from all of his all perspectives uh, to really get a, a good idea of who our Lord is. I mean, he's so vast that not even you know, the little book that's opened and presented unto us can really tell the whole story. So, you know, uh, by having uh, a breakdown as we had tonight uh, on the seven descriptions of Jesus Christ, you know, um, through every description, um, it was uh, uh, it was so edifying in that it it tells such a story about what God is and what he hopes and will do for each and every last one of us. And, um, um, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting and it gives us hope, uh, you know, when you know, at times it may feel like we have no hope, but just know that, you know, through every situation, the number of completion is seven, through every situation, he is the I am that can fill every problem that we can encounter. Uh, so uh, there isn't a leak that can come through with, will, that will spill tribulation in our life that God can't plug up. Um, so I truly do thank the Lord for blessing us with the word that he has. And I pray that everybody was edified by it. Um, I myself took notes as well. And I'm looking at it as I speak. <laughs> Praise the Lord. There was so much to glean from. Uh, there was actually one thing that I, I enjoyed listening to a lot. Uh, you brought something to to uh, to the light uh, when you had spoken about the, the portion of the, uh, the resurrection and the life number five. I loved how you uh, you uh, you dug into um, 
Psalm 16 and 10, when you made the comparison about how Lazarus was uh, considered corrupt after four days. And that's true. It's very true. Uh, according to Psalm 1610, that the Lord will not see corruption, though therefore he has to come up before day four. You know, mm -hmm. so that uh, and then you tied it again to Jonah. So that was uh, that was that was something that I wrote down. That was that was juicy. That was juicy. Um, but <laughs> I unless it was juicy. Amen. <laughs> we do thank the Lord for your service this evening. Amen. And without further ado, praise the Lord. I'd like to invite uh, to uh, like to pass the mic over uh, Amen to uh, Elder Betts uh, for closing comments. In Jesus name. Say praise the Lord and good evening to all. Amen. And certainly we have enjoyed, amen, the word this evening and the instructor, Elder Mark Brantley. And we do say thank you, Elder Brantley, for making time for us. Amen. And every time you have come, amen, to the table with us, you have certainly fed us richly through the word of God. And we thank you for that. Amen. Truly the seven I am's we did feast tonight. And I enjoyed uh, earlier in the lesson when you said long John Silver has nothing, <laughs> <laughs> has nothing on what Jesus gave. Absolutely. No one can feed us like he can. Yes, when he, when he feeds us, we always want to come back for more. <laughs> yes, so sir. I, I appreciate it tonight thank you so much and thank you for your encouragement and your prayers as we pre prepare for uh, the international holy convocation certainly the lord is good and we thank god for elder bonet the dean of the central jersey bible institute and his staff amen yeah. keeping the encouragement series going amen i know it's not an easy job amen reaching out amen gathering instructors and preparing it amen so we say thank you amen this has been a blessed week uh monday night we had the bible question and answer session and Deacon Holmes taught a wonderful lesson on the Masons. Tuesday, Bible Life Study, Elder Wilson taught on the unity and the body of Christ. Yesterday in the noonday prayer, Elder Wilson preached on a father's love. And now tonight, amen, Elder Brantley has blessed us with the seven I am's. And so I am full. Amen. This has been a blessed week. I am full. The Lord has given us something each day this week and blessed us. And so tomorrow there is no service scheduled. And uh, hopefully that gives everybody a chance to regroup and maybe spend some family time or just rest. So we have nothing scheduled for tomorrow. Amen. Take advantage of that opportunity. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Elder Brantley, Amen. again, we thank you and we appreciate you. Elder Bonet, back into your hands. Amen. Praise the Lord. Man, we do thank you, uh, Elder Betts. Amen. And for those, uh, I know there was a question about a copy of the slide presentation. We also have been uploading the recorded videos of the Encouragement Series to our YouTube page. Uh, for those that are on Zoom, I have um, uh, pasted the, copied the link into the chat. Um, so you can go there directly. For those that are not on Zoom, but on the phone, uh, you can just uh, type in the Central Jersey Bible Institute in YouTube and uh, our page should pop up and you can subscribe there so that next time we upload videos, you'll get a notice. OK, and um, we have plans on uploading this video uh, from tonight's uh, service onto YouTube as well. So look out for that. And um, uh, without further ado, uh, oh, I also also remind you and in invite you to come back next week. Uh, praise the Lord for our next encouragement series session, which will take place on July the 6th. Our instructor will be Elder, Elder Stephen Dokes. Uh, praise the Lord. So please uh, come on back next week. Uh, we look forward to having you there in Jesus name. And without further ado, let us close out uh, in the Lord's name. Let every heart pray. Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we love and thank you. We thank you, Lord God, for feeding us your words and your ways. We, Lord, ask that you will continue to lead us guide and guide us into all truth. And we thank you for being the I am that I am. Truly, Lord, we do yes. thank you for revealing your wonderful self unto us. Uh, even though, Lord God, we can only see you through the cleft of the rocks, that is still yes. quite enough, Lord God. And we thank you for that. Lord, please continue to bring us into a wonderful friendship with you, where we will in that one day see you all. We love and thank you immensely in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Bless every participant on the call. Guide and lead us by your spirit into all truth and keep us away from all that's not like you and ultimately keep us rapture ready. In Jesus' wonderful name, we do pray. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you, Elder Brantley.
All right. My pleasure. Appreciate the opportunity. God Amen. bless you all. God bless. God bless. It was awesome. Yes, God bless. God bless. God bless you, everybody. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Love you all.